Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello. My name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, never watched any of my videos, have no idea what I do here on my channel. I cover true crime cases and all the cases that I cover are a little bit older. They're all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button and also make sure to turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload. So I wanted to come up with another theme for this month. And of course, February is home to Valentine's day it's right in the middle of the month love but here on my channel we have to do things a little bit more twisted so i decided that for this month i'm just going to be covering cases where love goes horribly wrong and in this case the case that we're talking about today I don't think it was ever love at all. Before I get into today's case though, I do have to say that today's case involves some paranormal aspects. So if you're not somebody who believes in ghosts or spirits or our souls lingering a little longer on this plane, maybe this isn't the video for you, but if you do wanna hear about the case anyway, then just take this video for what it is and that's just a historical retelling because there's no way for me to cover this case without going into the spooky side of it. This case stands out as one of the strangest tales in the history of ghost lore, but it also stands out as one of the most peculiar incidents when it comes to our judicial system here in the United States. This is the story of the Greenbrier ghost or the case of Elva Zona Heaster Shoe. Also, some people pronounce the last name Hester, Heaster. I've seen some people do videos where they pronounce it both ways. I wasn't quite 100% sure, but I'm gonna go with the way it looks and that's Heaster. Elva Zona Heaster Shoe, who most often went by the name Zona, so I'll be calling her that for the remainder of this video, was born to parents Jacob Hedges Heaster and Mary Jane Robinson Heaster in Meadow Bluff, Greenbrier County, West Virginia. There is some speculation regarding the year of her birth. Some sources claim it was 1873 and some claim it was 1876. Her gravestone reads 1876, so I'm gonna guess that that may be the actual year. Month and day of the month is unknown from my knowledge. We also know that she did have two brothers, Harold Cole Heaster, who was born in 1882, and Lenny Heaster, who was born in 1888. Very little is known about the Heaster family or Zona's upbringing. Pretty much any information out there only highlights the main story itself, her death, what her mother experienced, and the trial. In October of the year of 1896, Zona would have been about 20. She met a man named Erasmus Stribling Trout Shoe. He went by the name Edward, but also his nickname was Trout, but I'll be calling him Edward. Edward was a drifter. He never really stayed in one location very long, and it was mostly due to work. He was a blacksmith. He made his way to Greenbrier County, met Zona, and they fell in love. From my research, it really seems like this was the first time Zona probably experienced these feelings. She was head over heels for Edward. And as you can tell from their wedding photo on the screen, he was an attractive man. They were a very good looking couple. Although this was really the first time that Zona experienced this romantic type of love, there was another love in her life and that was her daughter. She had actually given birth to a baby girl the year before in 1895. But again, there's very, very little information out there regarding this. I couldn't find out the daughter's name. I couldn't find out what happened to the daughter after all of this occurred. I couldn't find out the father's name, none of that. When it came to Edward though, Zona's mother, Mary, could not stand him. Mary just had this feeling about him, call it mother's intuition, but she did not trust him. This was not the man that she wanted her daughter to marry under any circumstance. Zona though, she couldn't fight these newly developed feelings inside of her. And when Edward asked her to marry him, she joyfully replied, yes. The couple soon married, almost within no time, and were living together in a two-story log cabin. Zona felt like she was in a fairy tale. But as we know, some fairy tales do not end in happily ever after. Early on January 23rd of the year of 1897, Edward asked a beloved local, who they all called Aunt Martha, if her son, Anderson, sometime during the day could come over to their home to check on Zona. Zona hadn't been feeling too well and Edward also wanted to see if Anderson could come over and help Zona do some chores around the home. Well, hours later, when Anderson walked into the shoe home, he found Zona's body lying at the bottom of the stairs. 
she was dead. Anderson ran back home to tell Aunt Martha what had happened. Aunt Martha goes over to where Edward was working and told him, and Edward swiftly makes his way back home. The local coroner and doctor, Dr. George W. Knapp, was notified. By the time Dr. Knapp made his way to the shoe home, Edward was there first. He didn't find Edward, though, standing at the stairs over his wife's dead body in shock. No, Edward had carried Zona upstairs, laid her on the bed, and dressed her in some of her best clothing, put a scarf around her neck, and placed a veil over her face, basically taking it into his own hands to prepare her for her funeral. Dr. Knapp thought it was odd, but he didn't say much. You never know how a person may respond to sorrow, but he had to examine Zona's remains, which Edward made nearly impossible for him to do. The entire time the doctor was trying to examine her, Edward kept moving her body because he basically had to be constantly touching her in some way, mostly by holding her, cradling her head, and rocking her back and forth. Dr. Knapp should have told Edward to leave the room so he could conduct a proper examination, but he didn't. So he kind of just worked around Edward's actions. Dr. Knapp did notice though, when he looked under the scarf, that Zona had some bruising around her neck. I'm sure you all know where this is going. And I guess this is something he just didn't focus too much on at the time because he listed her initial cause of death as everlasting faint, which basically means a common heart attack back in the Victorian time period. Then he came to the conclusion that it wasn't what he originally thought it to be, and he changed the cause of death to complications due to pregnancy, even though he wasn't sure she had actually been pregnant or not. Dr. Knapp had been seeing Zona prior to her death for health concerns, but he never told her for certain if she was pregnant. And still to this day, it is unknown if she actually had been or not. When Zona's mother though, heard what happened to her daughter, she immediately responded, the devil had killed her. And I'm sure you all know what Mary was thinking. Her daughter was lively and healthy and she marries this man and within three months, she's dead. Mary thought that Edward had to be responsible. Zona's body was taken to her parents' home for the wake, and during her wake, people could not help but notice Edward's erratic behavior. One moment, he was keeping to himself, sobbing profusely, and the next, he was having wild outbursts. No one thought too much of it because again, people respond differently to sorrow. The thing is though, that during the wake, it was almost like Edward didn't want anyone getting too close to his deceased wife. If someone came too close to her, he would barge right in and prevent them from doing so. One thing that people did notice though about Zona was that her head seemed a little loose, a little bit droopy, like it didn't have a stable neck to support it. Yes, she was dead, but it was apparent there was something strange about her neck. Edward put a rolled up cloth and clothing on either side of her head. He claimed it was to help her rest easy. He also put a scarf on her, which he claimed had been her favorite scarf while she was alive. Not long after laying Zona to rest in Seoul Chapel Methodist Cemetery, bizarre things started occurring. The first being that, according to Mary, she had been washing a sheet that she took from inside Zona's casket before they closed it. And apparently when she was washing it, the water turned red, then pink, then went clear again. Were her eyes playing tricks on her or was Zona giving her a sign from beyond the grave? She didn't know, but after this happened, she prayed every single night that Zona would come to her and tell her what actually happened the night that she died. That was all Mary wanted to know. She just wanted to know the truth. Well, apparently her prayers were answered. As the story goes, it is said that for four nights, Zona came to her mother and told her what happened. At first, just appearing as a bright light and then taking full human form. Mary stated that Zona told her that Edward had been a very angry and abusive husband. And that one night he became furious with her because she hadn't cooked any meat for dinner. She had cooked dinner, she just didn't make any meat and this made him furious, that he attacked her and strangled her so intensely that her neck snapped. Mary said that Zona's apparition spun its head completely around to prove to her mother that her neck had been broken. 
Mary decides after this that it's time to take action. She goes to prosecuting attorney John Alfred Preston. She was hesitant to tell him what she saw because of course she was like, oh my gosh, he's gonna think I'm crazy. But she wanted them to re-examine her daughter's body and she was going to do anything to get them to do that. John Preston saw how this affected Mary and believed her story. Above all though, he knew that locals had been talking about Edward's strange behavior at the wake and how loose Zona's head had been. He decided to start questioning people again, including Dr. Knapp. Dr. Knapp admitted that due to how Edward was acting that day, it was hard for him to do his job correctly and said that it would be best for them to conduct a full autopsy on Zona's remains to see if there had actually been another cause for her untimely death. A full autopsy. Hmm. Well, Edward did not like that too much, mostly because he knew that they were going to find out the truth. In an old one-room schoolhouse in the area with a room full of onlookers, Dr. Knapp and two other doctors performed the autopsy, and what they would find would be damning for Edward. As the Pocahontas Times reported, Zona's neck had in fact been broken. It had been dislocated between the first and second vertebrae, and there were finger marks on either side of her neck, the ligaments torn and ruptured, and her windpipe crushed. When they discovered all of this, Edward's face drops, and all he says is, they cannot prove that I did it. Now, don't you think that if you're innocent and found out that your wife's neck was broken while you were supposedly at work, that you would be on a hunt to find out who did it? No, not Edward. He knew they found out what he did after he thought he had gotten away with it. Edward was arrested, indicted, and awaiting a trial for the murder of Zona Heaster, his third wife. They did a little bit of digging into Edward's past and discovered some, again, damning information. Edward's first wife was a woman named Allie Esteline Cutlip. They divorced in 1889 when he went to prison for horse theft. And it's a good thing that they divorced because he probably would have killed her too. According to her, he was very abusive to her and one time he became so physical with her that an entire group of men had to tackle him off of her and they ended up throwing Edward into a freezing river nearby. Good. Edward's second wife was a woman named Lucy Ann Tritt, and only eight months into their marriage, she ended up dying under very odd circumstances, just like Zona had. Of course, after that was discovered regarding Zona, people started thinking that Edward must have also killed Lucy. It was said that while Edward was in jail awaiting his trial, that he was quite chipper that he said that he had fully grieved Zona by then and that he kept going on and on about how his ultimate goal was to have seven wives during his lifetime and that he felt like because he was still so young, he could easily achieve that. I guess he just wanted to keep marrying and murdering? I don't know. But Edward kept saying though that he was completely innocent when it came to what happened to Zona. The trial began in June of 1897 with many people testifying against Edward, and I mean many. The star witness was of course Zona's mother, but John Preston wanted Mary to come across as sane, so he told her to not bring up anything about her ghostly visions. She didn't. But Edward's attorney kept trying to drill into Mary and get her to talk about it, to try to make her look crazy. He kept questioning her about what she supposedly saw, trying to make her look like an unreliable witness. Mary, though, stuck by what she supposedly had seen. She never swayed away from her story. After realizing that Mary was not going to shift in any way, the attorney just gave up. In the end, Edward was found guilty. They couldn't reach a unanimous decision though. Most wanted him to be hanged, but not all of them. So he was given life in prison. Now, if you know anything about vintage cases in those days, life in prison did not really mean what it was supposed to. It almost always meant you would be in there for about 10 years. If you were let out in 10 years, you had been a good model prisoner. And if it lasted longer than 10, then you probably caused a bit of trouble behind bars. Edward wouldn't be locked up for long though before dying in March of 1900 from an epidemic that eventually made its way through West Virginia State Penitentiary. He is currently buried in a local cemetery in an unmarked 
grave. From my research, Edward was born in 1861. He was originally from Virginia and he did end up having a daughter with Allie Cutlip that was born in 1887. Her name was Gertrude and she had quite a few children herself. So there's definitely some of his family still out there today. When it comes to the star of the show, Mary, Mary lived until the year of 1916 and she kept to her original story of what she experienced. And according to her, she was never visited by her daughter's ghost again. Zona's father would die the very next year in 1917, all of them buried in the same cemetery near Zona. Now, you can say what you want about the paranormal side of the story, but ultimately, whatever happened, it ended up solving a murder and most likely preventing other women from becoming victims of an evil man. There are certain stories that leave a mark on the areas where they occurred in, and this one is no different. If you head to Greenbrier County, West Virginia, you will stumble upon a roadside marker that reads, Interred in nearby cemetery is Zona Heaster Shoe. Her death in 1897 was presumed natural until her spirit appeared to her mother to describe how she was killed by her husband, Edward. Autopsy on the exhumed body verified the apparition's account. Edward, found guilty of murder, was sentenced to the state prison, only known case in which testimony from a ghost helped convict a murderer. So that is the case of Zona Heaster, and it is a case that is so very tragic, but as soon as I had heard about it, probably about like 10 years ago or so, I was immediately fascinated by it. I had never heard anything like it. And I'm sure some of you who are watching this video, if you had never come across this story before and you were just hearing it for the first time because of this video, you may be feeling the same way that I did. Another case that I'm eager to see what you all have to say about it. So if you have any thoughts or opinions about this case, leave those down below. Do you think that Mary was in fact visited by her daughter's spirit? Do you think that maybe it was some sort of a dream or do you think that she just went to the prosecutor with this story to get him to feel some sympathy for her so they would end up re-examining her daughter's body because she just had this inkling that something else had happened. Leave all those thoughts down below in the comments. And if you have any other cases that you want me to cover this month where love does not necessarily end like a Nicholas Sparks book, then make sure to send those over to gabulosa's case request at gmail.com. And I will see you all in the next one.